If we want to go to heaven, we need a total transformation. We need it as individuals, and we need it as a church. And the time has come to speak about these things, because we are told that the straight testimony will cause the shaking. to have a total transformation. I'm glad to see you all came back. I worked hard to chase you all away. And I see I have to work harder. We're going to talk about 1888. Now, I'm not going to talk like everybody else talks about 1888. I don't want to be contentious in terms of specific doctrines, whether I see it this way or that way, and that I'll be lost if I don't have this or that understanding of the right doctrine, because I believe no one is saved by their right understanding of any doctrine. It doesn't save you. So, even if there are differences of opinion in terms of the exact composition of a doctrine, I don't think that is so critical. But the broad issue of 1888, that is critical. That is very critical. What happened in 1888, and why have I titled this on the borders of Canaan? I want to remind you of our text because this is what it's all about, transformation. Not to be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have been so programmed to think in a certain channel that it's a miracle. It takes literally a miracle to change that channel of thinking so that we can see what God's perfect will is. Discernment, that's what it's all about. I was pointed back to ancient Israel. But two of the adults of the vast army that left Egypt entered the land of Canaan. Their dead bodies were strewn in the wilderness because of their transgressions. Modern Israel are in greater danger of forgetting God and being led into idolatry than were his ancient people. That's serious. Many idols are worshipped, even by professed Sabbath keepers. God especially charged his ancient people to guard against idolatry. For if they should be led away from serving the living God, his curse would rest upon them. While if they would love him with all their hearts, with all their soul, and with all their might, he would abundantly bless them in basket and in store, and would remove sickness from the midst of them. Have you noticed that... Uh, it doesn't seem as if we have some special talents in the Adventist church in terms of uh, you know, mega healings and all of these things. Now, what are the lessons from the experience of the children of Israel? The modern church is repeating the history of ancient Israel. The trials of the children of Israel and their attitude just before the first coming of Christ illustrates the position of the people of God in their experience before the second coming of Christ. I like it that John the Baptist say, Do not say we have, you have Abraham as your father. You know, some of us believe salvation by denomination. There's no such thing. No salvation by genealogy. 
You have to have a personal relationship. Satan's snares are laid for us as verily as they were laid for the children of Israel just prior to their entrance into the land of Canaan. We are repeating the history of that people. Over and over. If it weren't for the spirit of prophecy, I'd be in deep trouble giving these lectures. Isn't that so? The history should be a solemn warning to us. We need never expect that when the Lord has light for his people, Satan will stand calmly by and make no effort to prevent them from receiving it. Let us beware that we do not refuse the light God sends because it does not come in a way to please us. If there are any who do not see and accept the light themselves, let them not stand in the way of others. These are interesting admonitions. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death. And there she quotes the Bible. You all know that verse. Wonderful. The song was not historical but prophetic. While it recounted the wonderful dealings of God with his people in the past, it also foreshadowed the great events of the future, the final victory of the faithful when Christ shall come the second time in power and glory. So these things are recorded for us. They concern us and we must make the application. Now, Kadesh Barnea has become to me a very interesting part of the typology what an amazing thing that happened there and not only once twice we love repeating our mistakes Deuteronomy 1 verse 2 there are 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir unto Gadesh Barnea Deuteronomy 1 verse 5 on this side Jordan, in the land of Moab, began Moses to declare the law, saying, The Lord our God spake unto us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough in this mount. Let's get away from this mount. You have dwelt long enough in this mount. What was given at the mount, by the way? The law. Turn you and take your journey and go to the mount of the Amorites and unto the places nigh unto... There unto in the plain and the hills and the vale in the south and by the sea and the land. Da 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 da. Unto the great river Euphrates. Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give unto them to their seed after them. Go and possess it. Dwelt long enough here. As they advanced, the way became more difficult. Their route lay through stones. Stony ravine and barren waste. Uh, do you get a picture? All around them was the great wilderness. You know, I was also so happy when I was baptized. There I was. Now life started, right? And uh, everything was going to be fine from now on. No, no, no. That's when the nightmare started. It was a barren waste, a stony ravine. All around them was a great wilderness, a land of deserts and pits, drought and the shadow of death, a land that no man passed through and when no man dwelt. Jeremiah 2 verse 6. Oh man, it's horrendous. Rocky gorges far and near, thronged with men and women, children, beasts, wagon, long lines of flocks. Progress was necessarily slow, toilsome, multitude after their long encampment were not prepared to endure the perils and the discomforts of the way. That's us. That's us. After three days' journey, just three days, and all the wheels came off. And where did it originate? With the mixed multitude. And who were they? That's us. Many of whom were not fully united with Israel and were continually watching for some cause of censure. The complainers were not pleased with the direction of the march. I'm like, why here? I mean, there's a pillar of cloud in front of you, but, you know, that pillar must have gone berserk. And they were continually finding fault with the way in which Moses was leading them. Just pick up the typological music here. 
Though they well knew that he, as well as they, were following the guiding cloud, dissatisfaction is contagious and it soon spread in the encampment. I've learned to deal with some issues in my life. You know, many people love to complain, come sit to me and with me and complain about this or that, or about someone. And when they complain about a particular someone, and that someone is around, they say, well, you come over here, There's some, you've got something to hear here. Will you please repeat that? Ah, <laughs> oh, end of story. It doesn't happen again. <laughs> Health reform. Again, they began to clamor for flesh meat. Though abundantly supplied with manna, they were not satisfied. Ah, the Israelites during their bondage had been compelled to subsist on the plainest and simplest food. But then keen appetite induced by privation and hard labor had made it palatable. You get used to it. Many of the Egyptians, however, were now among them and had been accustomed to a luxurious diet. Yes. Remember I belonged to a group called the Smulpap Gilde which is all these fancy professors who had all these special uh, menus that they made, and we went from house to house on weekends and ate all these unclean luxuries and licked our fingers. These were the first to mutter. At the giving of the manna just before Israel reached Sinai, the Lord had granted them flesh in answer to their clamors, but it was furnished them for only one day. We'll come to that later. And then Miriam and Aaron started grumbling. That's fascinating. So this represents whom? The priesthood. They started grumbling. Wouldn't happen in our day, right? Against Moses and criticized his marriage and Miriam became leprous. Do we not even grumble more, even more at the antitypical Moses? Hmm? Do we have priests and Levites who grumble about things? When Zipporah rejoined her husband in the wilderness, she saw that his burdens were wearing away strength. And she made known her fears to Jethro, who suggested measures for his relief. Now, how dare they consult someone else? I mean, that's ridiculous. So Miriam's antipathy to Zipporah began there. Smarting under the supposed neglect shown her and Aaron, she regarded the wife of Moses as the cause, concluding that her influence prevented him from taking them into the council as formerly. Now, had Aaron stood firmly for the right, he might have checked the evil, but instead of showing Miriam the sinfulness of her conduct, he sympathized with her, listening to her words of complaint, and thus came to share her jealousy. Well, we know the story. Miriam was smitten. Their ply pride was humbled in the dust. She became leprous. And Miriam was, however, shut out of the camp for seven days, although she was healed miraculously at the intercession of Moses. Now listen to this. Not until she was banished from the encampment did the symbol of God's favor again rest upon the tabernacle. Now, she wasn't just anyone. Wasn't she a prophetess? So she was a very high-ranking individual within the church, and yet even she had to be banished before God's favor returned. That's interesting for today. Well, the whole company had to wait for this. The whole lot. So a whole company can be kept back by how many people? One. 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 Deuteronomy says, And when we departed from Horeb, we went through all that great and terrible wilderness, which he saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said unto you, You are come unto the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God does give unto us. Behold, the Lord thy God has set a land before thee. Go up and possess it. As the Lord God of thy fathers has said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. Go and possess it. Does it, go and say, does it say there, go and fight? 
Go and make war. No, it just says go and possess it. And you come near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search out the land, and bring us word again by what way we must go up, and into what cities we shall come. There was no such instruction, but uh, they decided it was a good idea. So they sent out the twelve spies, and they began, the spies began when they came back, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. And they carried it between two of them. I would never believe that that was possible until I saw a bunch of grapes once in South Africa, which was about that big. One bunch. So I figured, okay. And this is a couple of thousand years later, fallen, so quite possible. The people were enthusiastic. They would eagerly obey the voice of God and go, but, oh, what a horrible word. After describing the beauty and the fertility of the land, all but two of the spies enlarged upon the difficulties and dangers that lay before the Israelites that they should undertake the conquest of Canaan. And they enumerated the powerful nations. The cities were walled and very great. The people who dwelt therein were very strong, impossible to conquer them. They had seen the giants of Anak. And then hope and courage gave place to cowardly despair. Here were all the giants. God said, go. And they looked at all the obstacles. And they brought an evil report. Nevertheless, the people be strong. How many were there that gave a good report? Two. Two. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwelt in the land. And the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, and the Amalekites dwell in the land in the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites by the sea and by the coast, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. That's rather nice. So they said, You're right, Caleb. <laughs> Sorry, we were silly. Let's go. <laughs> no, no, no. But, another horrible word. The men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it, is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in our own sight. 1888. All the giants had started in 1844. Marxism, communism, existentialism. We had them all on the board, remember? All the giants which had cost us. Evolutionism. All the isms of this world. Spiritism. They all started. And surely we are not able to conquer them. These giants are going to overcome us. And so we are afraid of the giants. I sat in a Kadesh Barnea church meeting once. I was invited. There's a lot of humor in the world, eh? I was invited to a town in South Africa, and I was supposed to give some lectures to the people there. There was, in fact, a group of people, about 200 of them, that were keeping the Sabbath all by themselves. And this is a non-SDA church, and they invited me to come and give lectures. And that's amazing to a non-SDA church. And when I started the lectures very gently, they got up and they said, no, 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 we don't want this gentle stuff. We want to know who is the Antichrist. We want to know the mark of the beast. We want to know why you keep Sabbath. We want to know all of those things. And I gave all those lectures. It was marvelous. And I came to my own church on the Sabbath day. And I sat in my own church and this young pastor gets onto the stage 
and he starts preaching. And he says, all we have to do is preach the love of Jesus. I have no problem with that. I like the love of Jesus. He says, because the other powers in the world are far more knowledgeable than us. And we have no chance to compete against them. We have no evidences except the love of Jesus. And that's what we must preach. Take, for example, evolution, all the great minds of the world, all the giants of Amalek, all of them believe in evolution. We haven't got a chance. I don't know why. I mean, in South Africa, he didn't know me. He didn't know me. The whole audience knew that I was sitting there. <laughs> and then he said, we have no chance against them, so all we can do is preach the love of Jesus. We have no counter-argument. Their walls are fortified. They are so strong. We haven't got a hope. We cannot take them. And I shook my head, and I looked at my wife, and I said, Oh, brother. You know, I didn't say a word. I just sat there and shook my head. And he saw it. And he said, You there, you there shaking your head. You don't know what you're talking about or what you're thinking. We have no chance against these evolutionists. None whatsoever. You don't understand. And he carried on with his lecture. <laughs> it was a very interesting Kanesh, Kadesh Banea meeting. Nevertheless, I wanted to say to him, excuse me, who is this giant called evolution, this uncircumcised Philistine? All you need is one little round stone and you'll blot him off the face of the earth and chop his head off with his own sword. Are you scared to go in against the giants? Now that was in 1888. Evolution was but the seed. What about now? Has it grown? Has it fortified its cities and fortified its walls? Has it got into the legislative chambers of the world's? Legislatures, yes or no? Is it compulsory to teach it at universities? Must your children be subjected to the lie that God is a liar and didn't create in six days? Who's this uncircumcised Philistine? Right? What do we need? We need a couple of Caleb's today. We need a couple of Caleb's because this same attitude can be applied to all of the isms. Ecumenism. This is the only way we can reach the people. We have to show them the love that we have in us. And they'll all capitulate and keep the Sabbath. Hello, they'll stab you in the back. They won't capitulate. They're the giants of Amalek. And the only way to go and conquer them is to say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that's standing in the way of the armies of the living Lord? There is no room for compromise in any of these stories. So what happens? We're like grasshoppers in their sight. We've got no chance of this. What is this? This is absolute absence of faith. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And the children of Israel murmured against Moses, against Aaron, against the whole congregation and said to him, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God that we had died in the wilderness? They even took up stones to go and stone them. And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return unto Egypt. Hmm. We wouldn't do that, would we? <laughs> no, not us. I was in one of our big, big, big universities. And there were two departments. The one dealt with uh, you know, geology and matters like that. And the other one was an official department. I went to the one and they said, hello, and they hugged me and we chatted and it was nice and we had the same faith and we believed, you know, God created and all of these wonderful things. And I thought I was in heaven. 
And then, as far as that door is away, there was a passage and a door going through to the other department. And as I walked into the other department, one of the leading individuals called me and said, uh, you are disgraced. What do you think you are doing? Talking against all of these things like evolution, you're making us a ridicule to the giants and the nations around us. That's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to reach them by becoming their friends and preaching what they're preaching. <laughs> That's the way to do it. It's amazing. Same place, same institute. Two departments of health. One is public health, and the other one is the normal medical faculty. I walked into the public health. Hi, how are you? <laughs> it's so nice to see you. Let's pray together. We now to pray together. Oh, what a wonderful thing. You know, if only we could bring this great message, this health message to the people and get them to give up their, their meat and their dairy and their this and their that. Wouldn't it be great? And you go through the door into the other department and they say, you troubler of Israel, you cause nothing but trouble. You'll be the cause and the death of millions. <laughs> and you're making our scientific stature a ridicule. <laughs> Same place. Very big institute of learning. Isn't that interesting? So we have the same attitudes today as we had then. But the good news is, Somewhere, there's always a Joshua or a Caleb. There always is. But uh, what was the ratio again? <laughs> Ten to two. <laughs> Why should we be any better off today than they were then? So don't be too discouraged. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel and Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of so-and-so, which were searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spoke unto the company, saying, The land which we passed through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight us in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, the land which floweth with milk and honey. You know what I love about Caleb? Here he is about 86 years old, and he says, give me the sword, I'll go and whack those big guys on that mountain when they went in the next time, and he went and whacked them. Isn't that so? Old man, watch out for these old, old Adventists with the big swords. Only rebel not against the Lord. I was sitting in a Kadesh Banea meeting once, I'm going to tell a few stories. Why not, right? Because this is reality. And I'm not telling these stories to whack anybody or to ridicule anyone. I'm just trying to show the parallels. And that we are exactly in the same boat. There was this one individual and he was compromising. He didn't want to say short chronology... And he didn't want to say, all right, it's billions of years. So he made it millions of years. Millions. So I went to him and I said to him, prominent, prominent people. I'm not talking small fry now. Prominent people. I said to him, why are you doing this? You know that the scientific world will never accept your few million years. They're talking billions of years. They think you're pathetic when you say millions of years. And if you don't want to come the other way towards God's way, God will say, why are you compromising with them? It's pathetic. You're actually sitting between two chairs. You're not accepted by what God says, and you're not accepted by the scientific world. You're sitting in limbo. Make a choice. Either sit there or sit here, but what's this middle thing here? He wasn't very charmed with me. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us. And he rebel not against the Lord. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. And they'll stone you. They'll stone you. They'll put you out. They'll say, that man 
may not speak on Hope Channel. I mean, he says creation took place in six days. I mean, we can't afford to be ridiculed like that, can we now? And the men which Moses sent to search the land who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander upon the land. Even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land, they died by the plague before the Lord. So, these leading brethren out there, please, why would you die, O house of Israel? Turn, turn from your evil ways and live. You're not going to look any better in the sight of the world by compromising, by fearing their fortified walls. If the walls are even as strong as the walls of Jericho, it just takes a trumpet blast and they're gone. Isn't that so? Why is it that the average American does not believe in evolution? Despite the greatest propaganda campaigns ever launched in the history of mankind. They still don't believe it. Are they that stupid? Or <laughs> is there something else? Psalms 106, they despised the pleasant land. They believed not his word. They murmured in their tents. They hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Is it so? Does it happen today? Yes or no? Does happens exactly the same. So the Lord said, okay, I'll grant you your request. They said, would that we had died in the wilderness. Okay, you may die in the wilderness. So they died in the wilderness. And the same happened to the seventh day Adventist church. Forty days they spied out the land. Forty years they would wander in the wilderness until that generation died. And the children shall wander in the wilderness forty years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of days in which you search the land, even 40 days, day for a year, shall you bear the iniquities, even 40 years, you shall know my breach of promise. My breach of promise. God breached his promise. Fascinating. Revoking of a promise. Altering of a purpose. Alienation. It was God's purpose to lead them directly into the promised land and drive out their enemy with hornets. They didn't have to fight against these Amalekites. Believe me, one tiny little hornet can chase a giant. Do you believe me? Yes. I tried to fix our dam's pipe once and I was working with this pipe and as I opened it, inside was a hornet's nest. I've never run so fast in all my life. I will send hornets before ye, which shall drive out the Hittite, the Canaanite, the Hittite from before thee. But they didn't believe it. God doesn't use the big things to scatter people. He uses the small things. Then he answered and said unto me, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight. Did the Lord say go up and fight? No. According to all that the Lord our God commanded us, and when you have girded on every man his weapon of war, you were ready to go up into the hill. And the Lord had said unto me, say unto them, Go not up, neither fight, I am not among you, lest you be smitten. So they were so blinded, says patriarchs and prophets, the Lord had never commanded them to go up and fight. It was not his purpose that they should gain the land by warfare, but by strict obedience to his commands. It's interesting how this works. I've been challenged a thousand times, if not more, to be in debate situations on radio or television on issues of health, evolution, or any one of those. Many times. I refuse, point blank, to do a debate. Why? Because in a debate, the loudest wins. Truth doesn't necessarily win. So I say, no, I'll state my case, and you can state your case, and people can make their decision, and may the chips fall where they fall. They've tricked me. They've tricked me. They invited me on a big radio station, and they had all their big guns over there, and I didn't know. 
that the opposition was sitting there and they tried to belittle and slaughter me and it was incredible. But you know what's amazing? If you are trapped in a situation like that and it's not your fault, it's amazing how God <laughs> digs a pit and they fall into their own pit. <laughs> it was incredible. You know, when they run out of argument, what must they do of necessity? Attack the man. That's right. If you, can't, if you don't have an argument, attack the man. They did it to me here in this university here in your own country, in this very town. You have two very big universities. One is after a river and the other one is also after a river, isn't it? Well, one of the river universities. <laughs> 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 I was giving a lecture there on evolution and uh, the lecturer got very angry and eventually the students were siding with me so what did he draw the racist card I was from South Africa so he said you're a racist <laughs> I said to him you've just capitulated and lost your argument because you have no more guns to fire with, so you come up with a personal accusation that you cannot even, you know, substantiate. And in this other case, it was very interesting on the radio. They were, they were stating their case. It was on dairy. Oh, the subject of dairy. And I was giving the answers and the people were phoning in and saying, but these people are talking rubbish. This man makes sense. That's rubbish. And that makes them very angry. <laughs> and I changed to a university which was a previously disadvantaged university. You know how it works? And I'd come from a very advantaged university and gone to a disadvantaged university. So they drew that card. Oh, it was marvelous. Marvelous. They drew the card out of the hat and they said, Yes, the only reason why you say these things is because you come from a second-rate university. We are from a very superior university. Therefore, what you are saying is not tenable. So I said, well, that's very fascinating because these days everything is peer review. That's published, which means it goes overseas to the same people that peer review you. So there's no such thing as working at a second-rate university or first-rate university. But let me just ask you a question. You have a professor, and I named his name, and you have another one, and another one, and another one, and I went through about five of them, that are working at univers your university, high-rated scientists, all of them professors. They were all my students. In fact, they were my PhD students. So the second-rate university professor trained the first-rate university professors, <laughs> and uh, therefore your argument, of course, is substantiated, right? <laughs> they were ridiculed on that radio station. It was amazing. God opens the ways. But don't think that you can go out there and say, Today, I'm going to lick them. I'm going to give them something. You will come off second best. It's not the way to do it. Let the Lord do the fighting. Let Him do the cutting. Let the truth do the cutting. We don't have to be cutting. And to whom swear he that you should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? You don't go in. So some had faith and could have entered, but all were turned back into the wilderness. Only two had faith. How many had to turn back? All of them. All of them. Even Moses, Caleb, Joshua, everybody had to go back into the wilderness. Well, Joshua and Caleb and Moses could have said, you know, let's start a Reform Adventist movement. These guys are pathetic. Let's separate from them. Did they do that? No. They chose to suffer with the people of God. Were they nice, these people of God? No, they wanted to stone them. <laughs> they must have called them horrible names. They murmured in their tents behind their backs. 
Do you think it doesn't happen in our day? Of course it happens. The Apostle Paul plainly states that the experience of the Israelites and their travels had been recorded for the benefit of those living in this age of the world. Those upon whom the ends of the world had come. We do not consider that our dangers are any less than those of the Hebrews, but greater. This was but a type. We've got an anti-type. They had one group of people to worry about. Wherever I go in the world, wherever I go, there's usually a letter that precedes me from some high official. Don't let this man talk on. Fascinating world. Modern Israel are following in their footsteps and the displeasure of the Lord is as surely resting upon them. We are repeating the history of that people. We are standing, as it were, on the borders of the eternal world, she wrote in 1879. The Advent movement would have entered in 1888, but there was a tendency to remain camped around Sinai. Don't want to go there. The law was central to our theology. The law, the law, we are saved by keeping the law. And the sanctuary message, the only means of entering Canaan, was not applied. We did exactly the same as the Jews did. The law has its important position but is powerless unless the righteousness of Christ is placed beside the law to give its glory to the whole royal standard of righteousness. Wherefore the law is holy, the commandment holy and just and good. The problem is not with the law, the problem is with us. We think we can earn God's favor. We think we are rich. Now what we want to present, how you may advance in the divine life, we have many excuses. I cannot live up to this or that. What do you mean by this or that? Do you mean that it was an imperfect sacrifice that was made for fallen race upon Calvary? That there's not sufficient grace and power granted us that we work away from our natural defects and tendencies? That it was not a whole Savior that was given in us. We hear so many sermons exactly like that today. We can't keep the law. Or do you mean to cast reproach upon God? Well, you say it was Adam's sin. Kids say that. I didn't ask to come into this world. It's your fault. You say I'm not guilty of that and I'm not responsible for his guilt and fall. Here are all these natural tendencies. They are in me. And I'm not to blame if I act out these natural tendencies. Well, who's to blame? Is God to blame? Pretty good question. Why were they kicked out of the Garden of Eden? Because of disobedience. So what must be the condition to go back into Eden? Surely not disobedience. Otherwise God would be inconsistent, right? It's logical. I cannot even understand how the modern theologians can come up with an equation like that. But believe me, they manage. So there were two gentlemen... Now please, I'm not going to go into details of exact theological correctness in order to be saved. I'm only interested in principles. I'm not going to go that route. It's divisive. And many of our evangelists and speakers go that route and they divide. I don't want to do that. I'm not going to say exactly this is how, what you must believe or that must, must, you, must you believe. But the broad principle of righteousness is not difficult to understand. Two people. Is there an anti-type here? There were two there. You'll say, but these were not perfect. Caleb and Joshua were pleased. They were not perfect either. They had their mistakes as well. Nobody's perfect. There's none righteous, not one. But their message was right. Their message was right. The Lord in His great mercy sent a most precious message to the people through Elders Wagoner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety 
It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in the obedience to all the commandments of God. But not through our strength, through His strength. When he had lost sight of Jesus, they needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he might dispense rich gifts upon men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. No, they were camped at Sinai. Just like Israel, they were camped there. They were happy with the fact that they discovered the law and they discovered their own righteousness. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of His Spirit in a large measure. Today we say we've accepted this message. We haven't because we haven't applied it to the heart. That's where the key is. So the third angel's message is the proclamation of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The commandments of God have been proclaimed. But the faith of Jesus has not been proclaimed by Seventh-day Adventists as of equal importance. The law and the gospel going hand in hand. I cannot find language to express the subject in its fullness. I gave a whole sermon here once on the faith of Jesus. Not enough to have faith in Jesus. I need the faith of Jesus. The faith that is prepared to go to the cross all the way. It's talked of but it's not understood. There's no mistake here when it says the faith of Jesus. I've had the question asked, what do you think of this light which these men, Jones and Wagner, are presenting? Why I've been presenting it to you for the last 45 years, the matchless charms of Christ. This is what I've been trying to present before your minds. From the light God has given me, we shall be separated and scattered, many of us. You will have to stand in places alone. You will not have any connection with other leading minds that you can gather strength from them. You will have to stand with your own God by your side and know that He is by your side. We want to know that He is by our side today, that He is right with us. So when we come together in this house, we should remember that the Master of Assemblies is here. This is incredible. When I started off as an evangelist, I was working with this little man, you know him by now, a duplicy. And then the conference sent him to the middle of nowhere. And uh, he said, I can't go. I've got to work with this man. I've got to, we, we're working together. You know, we're complimenting each other. This is great. I wrote a letter to the conference. He says, why are you doing this? The church just wrote a letter to the conference. He was gone to the middle of nowhere to a desert with three Adventist members, all of them over 90, and all of them wanting, wanting to slaughter him and anyone who even came close. And I thought, what a waste. But you know what? I was forced to start working on my own. And he was forced to work on his own. And Pastor Gill is forced to work on his own. And he was scattered all over the place. And... We can't rely on each other. We can't. And we get into straight places and we get into trouble and we get into turmoil and there's no one to turn to except to God. No one to turn to. It's a lesson. It's a lesson book. We're here. We're suffering this thing. It would have been nice to go out. How? Two by two. Wouldn't it? We get to do it occasionally. It's nice. It's such a huh, feeling. But it's a luxury. I'm afraid it seems we cannot afford. You should remember that the master of assemblies is here. God does not leave the ship for an ignorant pilot to steer anywhere. He just stands at the helm and then we work under orders. Now people constantly phone me and say, why didn't you check this with the leading elders? I did. Just not them. For good reasons. <laughs> we want the truth as it is in Jesus. We do not want to go away from the meeting. And if there is a word spoken that we cannot agree with, scatter that where the brethren or sister and sisters are. No, go to your knees. Pray that we may know what is truth. 
And the teachers in the Sabbath school, they need to know there are minds that are molding and it's no light matter to stand up before the pupils and claim that you have light when perhaps there's dangerous error mixed with it. We have to be sure that we don't speak nonsense ourselves. We have to be very sure. The world should no longer say Seventh-day Adventists talk the law, the law, but do not teach or believe Christ. Do they say it to this very day, yes or no? The efficacy of the blood of Christ was to be presented to the people with freshness and power that the faith may be hold, held upon its merits. We have only one perfect photograph of God, and this is Jesus Christ. Probably one of the nicest statements in the spirit of prophecy. Isn't it nice? I like it. So unless he makes it his life business to behold the uplifted Savior and by faith accept the merits which is it is privileged to claim, the sinner can no more be saved than Peter could walk upon the water. Now it has been Satan's determined purpose to eclipse the view of Jesus and lead men to look to men. Hmm. The truth to trust to man, to be educated, to accept help from man. So we need all of these tutors today and the coaches and the trained people to tell us what we must believe. Hello, I've got a Bible and a spirit of prophecy to tell me what I must believe. I don't need some coach who thinks he's been trained in who knows what place on this planet to come and tell me what to believe. Isn't it so? God has given everything we need. Ellen White stood by those who preached the message of righteousness by faith as Moses stood by Joshua and Caleb. We have a parallel. This is type and anti-type. I've traveled from place to place attending meetings where the message of righteousness by Christ of Christ was preached. I considered it a privilege to stand by the side of my brethren and give my testimony with the message for the time. And I saw the power of God attended the message wherever it was spoken. The third angel's message in verity. This is what it is. It is the third angel's message in verity. Righteousness by faith. If you accept that the character of God and the law are one and the same thing, and you accept that only by the merits of Christ you can be saved, then that's the third angel's message, isn't it? It's not that complicated to understand. The Lord our God spake unto us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough on this mount. Get away. You don't sacrifice the law, but you preach the everlasting gospel, which stands on two legs. It's not a cripple. It has the law and the righteousness of Christ. And if you divorce one from the other, you've got nothing. But at Kadesh Barnea, they couldn't enter in. Because they wanted to enter in by their own strength. And the giants were overwhelming. That's the problem. And we have the same problem to this day. If you would stand through the time of trouble, you must know Christ, appropriate the gift of his righteousness, which he imputes to repentant sinners, and then you go, because he said so. Two-thirds of those attending Minneapolis opposed the message. That's incredible. If those who claim to have a living experience in the things of God has done their appointed duty as God ordained, the whole world would have been warned by now. The whole world. Had the purpose of God been carried out by his people in giving the world the message of mercy, Christ would ere this have come. We would have gone home. Some of our brethren are not receiving the message of God upon the subject. They appear to be anxious that none of our ministers shall depart from their former manner of teaching the good old doctrines. And isn't it incredible how Satan manages to make everyone involved in pendulum swing theology? You either sit in the one extreme or you go to the other extreme. There's never any balance. You're either this or the other. I always say it's like a boat. Like a narrow boat. And one starts building a a gang walk, a plank, and he climbs out of the boat and he goes and sits over there. And then the boat does this. And so to balance the boat, what does the other person do? Builds his plank to the other side and he climbs out over there. 
And then someone else starts, and eventually they're all sitting outside the boat on their planks. Hello, can we get back <laughs> into the boat, please? Any problem with that? As the ten un unfaithful spies centered their criticism on Moses, Caleb, and Joshua, so the Minneapolis delegates did exactly the same to the antitype. They criticized the Spirit of Prophecy, they criticized Jones and Wagner. To those whom God had sent with a message, only men. But what is the character of the message which they bear? Will you dare to turn from or make light of the warnings because God did not consult you as what would be preferred? God calls upon men who will speak and who will cry loud and spare not. And he raises up messengers for a particular time. They have too much zeal or too much in earnest, speak with too much positiveness. Let's tone down the message, you know. Do, do they say the same today? I love these parallels. The message that would bring healing and life comfort to many a weary soul is in a measure excluded. Christ has registered all the hard, proud, sneering speeches spoken against his servants as against himself. It's very comforting. There is to be in the churches a wonderful manifestation of the power of God, but, I like that word too, it will not move upon those who have not humbled themselves before the Lord and opened the door of their heart to confession and repentance. We need that in the church. Study the spirit of prophecy, study these things, and you will see that this is not some fable. Why, they say, should we not know the Spirit of God when we have been in the work so many years? Because they did not respond to the warnings, the entreaties of the message of God, but persistently said, I am rich and increased in goods. That's our problem. Psalm says, but murmured in their tents and hearkened not unto the Lord. I shall never think to be called to stand under the direction of the Holy Spirit as I stood at Minneapolis. This is a key message. The Bereans, she mentions, the watchers on the wall, and then sadly, it is quite possible that Elder Jones and Elder Wagoner may be overthrown by temptations of the enemy. But if they should be, this would not prove that they had no message from God. See, that's important. We latch on to something and we say, but look, they became apostate, therefore whatever. No. Maybe they became discouraged and then became apostate. So maybe there are others to blame too, but you cannot excuse their apostasy. They did apostatize. Huh. But should this happen, how many would take this position and enter into a fatal delusion because they are not under the control of the Spirit of God? They walk in the sparks of their own kindling and cannot distinguish between the fire that they have kindled and the light which God has given. Sin on the part of the messenger of God would cause Satan to rejoice and those who have rejected the message and the message would triumph. But it would not at all clear the men who were guilty of rejecting the message of truth sent of God. We've got no excuse. No excuse. As a people, we are not advancing in spirituality as we're near the end. We do not realize the magnitude and importance of the work before us. We are not doing one twentieth of what God requires us to do. We are repeating the history. We have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa. <laughs> She's cute, right? That have neither dew nor rain. We must preach Christ in the law. What is that? Christ in the law. And there will be sap and nourishment in the preaching that will be as food to the famishing flock of God. Quote to them what the reformer said. Wesley, I cannot live without the law for one moment. For the law sends me to Christ. And I cannot live without Christ for one moment because Christ sends me to the law. Isn't that beautiful? Wow, it's so, it's so rich. We preach today, we're under grace. We're not under law. What a misnomer. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. 
So if there's no transgression, I have no need of grace. So if I'm under grace, I am of necessity under law. Is that not right? Grace without law is an idiosyncrasy. It doesn't, it's an oxymoron. It cannot exist. And yet it is the chief theology of the world out there. It's not difficult to overthrow that theology. Why is it that we have this pendulum swing? Preach the law, but preach Christ in the law. It's simple. We must not trust in our own merits at all, but in the merits of the Jesus of Nazareth. That's what we need. I saw the brethren assented to the light God had given, but there were those connected with our institutions, especially with the Review and Herald Office and the Conference, who brought in elements of unbelief. Will it be the high people or the <laughs> foot soldiers that cause the most problems? The high people. They brought in the elements of unbelief. It was assented to, but in no special change was made. So they say, sure, we believe it, but they don't apply it. The church has turned back from following Christ the leader and is steadily retreating towards Egypt. Do we see that? When we see some of the programs that are put on, when we see what happens in some of the conferences, I've, I've been in many situations. I'll tell you some later as we go on. Satan would have it thus. Christ cannot take up the names of those who are satisfied in their own self-sufficiency. He cannot importune on behalf of a people who feel no need of his help, who claim to know and possess everything. That's why God brings us into straight places. That's why we're going through tribulation. That's why things are going to get tough. And only if you have a root in him will you be able to stand. So in 1888, the world was ready for the second coming in every single way. 1888, the Fifth Congress, first session, the Blair Sunday Bill was to be passed. That was the date. To secure to the people the enjoyment of the first day of the week, commonly known as the Lord's Day, as a day of rest, and to promote its observance as a day of worship. We were at Kadesh Barnea. We were going into Canaan. It was introduced by Senator Blair. You know the day, name? May 21, 1888. Proposing an amendment to the Constitution of the United States respecting establishment of religion and the free public schools. Fascinating. So we were ready. Adventists were ad arrested in the South, put in chain gangs because they refused to keep a false Sabbath. The Lord's Day Alliance, when was it founded? 1888, the Lord's Day Alliance of the United States was founded in 1888. Here's their own webpage. Check it out. 1888, fascinating dates. There's nothing wrong with Adventist theology. There's something very wrong with theologians who don't believe it. There's nothing wrong with Adventist theology. The Lord's Day Alliance of the United States exists to encourage Christians to reclaim the Sabbath, the Lord's Day. As a day of spiritual and personal renewal, enabling to impact the, their communities with the gospel. In challenging economic times like the world faces in 2009, the Lord's Day Alliance is seeking to uncover spiritual truths regarding how the Ten Commandments combined with Jesus' teachings about money can provide guidance for Christ. This is fascinating stuff. We're going to talk about this in a moment in the next lecture. Here we're mixing... Economics with Christianity. Is that right? So-called Christianity. Economics. The mark of the beast. Is it an economic law or is it a religious law? It's both. <laughs> it's both. We'll see. Fascinating stuff. Hmm. Since when? What's the date? Coincidence, of course, right? No, I don't believe in coincidence. I believe in providence. 1888, the occult societies teach that the new dispensation has begun. Why 1888? This is the final thrust. 
We accept as fact the following, the drama in the heavens, the new dispensation which had its actual beginning in 1888 will have reached its apex as has the old and that a saviour, a great leader, one greater than any before, will be possibly already is born. There we go. The coming masters. Well, they can wait for their master. 1888, the world was ready. Dwight Moody, Pearson were the leading great revivalists. They were preaching the Christian world was ready. To either accept or reject the message. Students' volunteer movement of the foreign missions was organized. There was an occult explosion. The Sunday debate was raging. Adventists were persecuted for Sunday violations. Everything was ready to fulfill the prophecy exactly as it stands in the book of Revelation. But there was only a Joshua and a Caleb and a Moses. And nobody else. Fascinating. And then the revivals died down. The Moody's went to sleep. I liked Dwight Moody. Moody. Not so sure about his affiliations <laughs> and his activities in the ecumenical movement, but he said some great things. One of my favorites is when his brother was praying so long and he got up and he said, Congregation, let's sing hymn number so-and-so while our brother finishes his prayer. <laughs> and then you take Ellen White. Public prayers should be short and to the point. Ah, nice era. Guest view. Faith meets at Parliament of World Religions. Just after 1888, we have a Parliament of Religions coming into existence and we're Growing the giants? If we thought the giants were big then, how big are the giants today? Can we face up to the mighty ecumenical movement? Can we? And why do we sit in them? Why do we pay membership fees? Fascinating. 1893, the Chicago Parliament of World Religions was convened to gather the world's faith together for the first time. All of this started already in 1844, but by here they were organizing. They were fortifying their walls. They knew Israel was coming. Here was the thing coming, 1893, the first parliament of religions. The dread suffered federal and confederate union. Federal council of churches, national council of churches, all of these things coming together. hundred years later, things have certainly changed. The Parliament of World Religions is again underway here. Melbourne, 6,000 participants. Holiness, Dalai Lama, all of them coming together to mobilize public opinion about the values of religious traditions. <laughs> Where's the Bible? Who cares about the Bible, right? Let's concentrate on our traditions. So, salvation by dance. 2009 Parliament is a contingent of over 100 seminarians of the United States. The Henry Luce Foundation, all these Masonic... I don't want to go into conspiracy theories, but he's Masonic. You realize that, right? Conspiracy or no conspiracy is Masonic. To prepare for the Parliament, all the seminarians had to take a course at their home school dealing with religious diversity, the urgency of interreligious co cooperation, and the Hatford Seminary, Catholic Theological Union, Rabbinicals, the Trinity Lutheran Union Theological Seminary, Yale, Harvard, Vanderbilt, half of them are Jesuit controlled anyway. So with the rejection of righteousness by faith doctrine, Adventism also experienced the greatest apostasy in its short history. Modern Israel rejected the testimony of the spirit of prophecy just as readily as literal Israel rejected it at Kadesh Barnea. That's why that man, that rector at our universities can say, cannot be dictated to by a woman with only three years of education. That's like taking the compass and throwing it overboard. And drifting and drifting and drifting towards Rome. 
It was not the will of God that Israel should wander 40 years in the wilderness. He desired to lead them directly to the land of Canaan and establish them there, happy and holy people. But they could not enter in because of unbelief. Have we done the same thing? Yes. But why could not they enter in because of unbelief? Because of their backsliding, their apostasy. They perished in the desert. And others were raised up to enter the promised land. In like manner, it was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be so long delayed and his people should remain so many years in this world of sin and sorrow, but unbelief separated them from God. They refused to do the work he had appointed them to do. You will not preach this three angels' messages. You will not say that the papacy is the Antichrist. Do you think I've heard that in my life before? Yes, from the kings and queens in this church as well. In mercy to the world, Jesus delays his comings that sinners might have an opportunity to hear the warning and find in him a shelter before the wrath of God shall be poured out. So the antitypical delay, the tarrying time, was foretold in the parable of the ten virgins. We know it. Ellen White urged that Battle Creek should be moved into smaller institutes where the establishment leadership was so perplexed that they shipped her off to Australia. Biggest mistake they ever made. <laughs> A mighty community came up that also learnt the ways of Kadesh Barnea eventually. How can finite man carry the burdens of responsibility for this time? His people have been far behind. Human agencies under divine planning may recover something of what is lost because of the people who had great light did not corresponding piety, sanctification, zeal specified in the plans. We're in trouble. We may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination many more years, she wrote. As did the children of Israel. Hmm exactly what happened now this is interesting there was a delay but there was not an annulment and the same will happen today the Lord of hosts has sworn saying surely as I have thought so shall come to pass and as I have purposed so it shall stand it will happen but there's a delay for the Lord of hosts has purposed and who shall disannul it and his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? So while all the world is plunged in darkness, there will be light in every dwelling of the saints. God's purpose for Israel will meet with literal fulfillment. That which God purposes, man is powerful, powerless to disannul. Even amid the working of evil, God's purposes have been moving steadily forward to their accomplishment. It's going to happen. The question is just when? 1 John 1, 6 to 11, we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not see the truth. If we walk in the light, as he in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Don't forget that. I have a whole lecture on that. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We have many people in our church who claim to be on this sinless, perfectionist track. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Important things for Adventists. He that says he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness. Oops. Oops. He that loves his brother abideth in the light. He that hateth his brother is in darkness. Hmm. We could be in trouble here. I think that requires another lecture. These things are written for us. They are applicable to the churches of the seventh day Adventist. I do not hate my brother. I'm not so bad as that, but how little they understand their own hearts. We're in trouble. The Lord will work so that the disaffected ones will be separated from the true and loyal ones as they died in the wilderness. So it happened to the seventh day Adventist. So at Kadesh Barnea, they rejected divine leadership through the spirit of prophecy. Same. The Lord said unto me, Say unto them, Go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you, lest you be smitten before your enemies. And so they went up presumptuously. 
They just did it. The Amorites which dealt in the mountain came out and they gave them the hiding of their life. If we think we can do it by ourselves, we've had it. We cannot enter in by our own means. Forget it. We're going to go in with the people of God or we're not going to go in at all. So ye abode in Kadesh many days, according unto the days that ye abode there. And by a prophet the Lord brought out Israel. Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly. Therefore shall he leave his blood upon him, and his reproach shall his Lord return on him. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of the temptation in the wilderness. Hebrews 3 verse 8 will do the same. This is that Moses which said unto the children, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you and to your brethren. Like come to me. The parallels there between Jesus and Moses. That's an amazing story. That is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel. He spoke there. The same Jesus who leads this church led that church. And our fathers wouldn't obey him. And they went back to Egypt. We do the same thing. So the testimonies of his spirit call your attention to the scriptures. Point out your defects of character. Rebuke your sins. Therefore you do not heed them. And to justify your carnal ease loving course. You begin to doubt whether the testimonies are from God. So we have whole nations. Who follow after some guy. Who rejects the spirit of prophecy. And they suffer the consequences to this very day. It's incredible. The church has turned back from following Christ their leader and is retreating towards Egypt. These are facts. This is spirit of prophecy. This is not condemnation. It's just a fact. Yet few are alarmed or astonished at their want of spiritual power. Doubt and even disbelief of the testimonies of the Spirit of God is leavening our churches everywhere. That's the problem. That's the problem. They didn't listen to Moses. They don't listen to the spirit of prophecy. Satan would have it thus. I'll tell you a story. I had to do a campaign in the largest economic powerhouse in Germany. Forget it. I blew it, right? <laughs> Germany. Who cares? <laughs> it was Germany. Where was it? Germany. <laughs> and I was invited to do a campaign. And there I traveled. And I flew. And I was fetched at the airport in Berlin. And I had to travel for three hours with some man I didn't know at all. And we went to this little place where this tiny little church was with just a handful of members. And it just happened to be right next to our largest college. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yes. Now, I really had no idea of any of this. I'm totally innocent. You can ask my wife. I don't know a day before when I'm flying, where I'm flying to, or what I'm going to do. I really am like that. I haven't got the foggiest idea. I mean, people phone me and they say, uh, what is your sermon on such and such a Sabbath in three years' time, and what hymns do you want? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> I don't know. So I give them anything. I say, you make it up. I don't care. Whatever you make up. I change everything. You've noticed that, right? <laughs> That's me. Now I'm sitting for three hours with this man in the car. This, this is interesting stuff. Three hours. Now, what do you do when you sit with a strange man for three hours in a car? You ask, you know, questions. Where do you come from? How did you become an Adventist? And all of this. This man was a high officer in the communist regime. His job was to make sure that anybody trying to get across to the West was killed instantly. That was his job. He was such a high communist, he had a regular pass to go to the West to recruit for communism. Normally they locked them away. He was allowed out. He was high in the military. Total atheist. 
And they were busy, he told me, of all kinds of occult things which people would say are conspiracies. And he told me what he was busy with, all of these strange things, speaking with spiritism and all kinds of things. And at one stage in his life, somewhere, he came across an Adventist, but he didn't know what that was at all. And this man had spoken nicely to him and told him that this was a bad thing that they were doing and gave him good reasons, but he'd filed it somewhere in file 13 and forgotten about it. And then the Berlin Wall fell and his life crumbled. It collapsed. Of course, the Western military took over and the Western military took over that military, so he was still in the military, but he was now paid by West Germany and no longer by East Germany. When he got his first paycheck, the paycheck said deduction for church tax. Because that's what they do in that country, and it totally freaked him out. How dare they deduct for church tax? He didn't believe in any of this nonsense. And so he said uh, to the officers, I don't want this church tax deducted. And they said, well, then you have to resign from the church. He says, I resign from the church. And they laughed, these Western officers, and said, you must say, which church? He says, I don't know. What's the biggest church in this country? They said, Lutheran in East Germany. Lutheran. He says, yeah, all right. So he right. I resign from the Lutheran church. That weekend he went home to his parents and he told them this silly thing that had happened. The parents said to him, but you're actually Catholic. Now being German, <laughs> being German and perfect, he went back to the authorities and said, uh, I resigned from the wrong church. Can we please correct that? I want to resign from the right church. So he wrote another letter, I resigned from the Catholic church. And they laughed like drains. They thought it was very funny. And over time, he became very disillusioned. His ideals were gone. Everything he'd fought for in his life had dissipated. And he remembered this conversation with this Adventist. And he looked up Adventists. But he didn't know it was a church. He thought it was a club. So he went there and he joined. And he said, can I join your institute? And they said, well, it's not that easy. You have to sort of, you know, do some studies. So they did some Bible studies. And then he said, well, what's the next thing? And they said, well, then you must be baptized. He says, great, let's go for it. So he was baptized. Didn't have a clue what was going on. That happens over there. And there he was in the church. And he said, now what happens next? He says, well, we meet next Sabbath. Great. So he was there for the next few Sabbaths. And he said, but excuse me, after a while, what are we doing here? <laughs> We're just sitting here. What do you guys do? Don't you do anything? And they said, no, this is it. This is what you do. You come here and you say, no, that's pathetic. There must be something better to do than this. And they just received back from the East German government everything that the government had confiscated from all the churches. The buildings had been confiscated. So they gave them different buildings for the churches. The warehouses were full of stuff that had been confiscated and been returned. They said, all right, if you really want to do something, then come after work in the weekdays and we'll sort out all this garbage that has been returned. What can be kept and what can't be kept? And so he did that. He started working. And then he came across this pile of boxes and he went to the pastor and he said, excuse me, I found these books. What, what must we do with them? And the man looked at them and he said, no, we don't need them. You can burn them. Put them in the furnace. And he said, but are the Adventists who wrote these things? Yes, the Adventists. But uh, why do we burn them then? That's antiquated. That's from a previous century. We don't need them anymore. They don't apply to our time. Burn them. What was it? Of course, it was Spirit of Prophecy books. And so he felt bad to burn it, so he took it home. And he started reading, and he started reading things like Great Controversy. And suddenly, now this is a sad story because where is he? He's in an Adventist church, right? Suddenly he realizes, good grief, this is Adventism. I relate to this. This makes sense. This is logical. But obviously I'm the only one left. <laughs> so he thought he was the only Adventist left. 
So he thought, well, I have to start evangelizing the world. But he came across brick walls, so he started moving around his previous country, going from town to town, finding churches, and eventually he found one here and one there and one there that still believed this stuff, outdated as it was. And eventually they decided that they would form a group, and they formed a little church of their own, people that still believed it, and that was that little church. And they invited this fanatic from Africa <laughs> to come and do a campaign. Needless to say, the powers that be at, at the mighty institution close by wrote a warning from the highest level that no student was allowed to attend the meetings. No better advertisement could ever be written. <laughs> And so the place was packed. <laughs> it was a fascinating meeting, really. It was one of my very interesting meetings. These guys had spared no, no trouble. It was a nice hall. The Oompa band of the town was there. Oompa, Oompa, <laughs> with, complete with lederhose, the whole bit. The mayor was there. Everything happened there. It was an incredible meeting. Packed with students. They weren't supposed to be there. But they were there. And then uh, as I wanted to start, this guy gets up and his eyes were wild. And he came to me and he shouted at me. And he put his nose in my face. Or no, his finger in my nose, sorry. And he said, are you going to preach the three angels' messages? And I looked at this guy and I thought, well, I said, well, yes. And he got onto the stage and he screamed at the people, Get out! These men are deceivers. They're preaching the three angels' messages. It's a damnation message. Get out! And I started to pray and I said, Lord, get rid of this man, please. And he shouted and screamed and shouted and screamed and walked and walked and walked and screamed and walked out and screamed on the other side. And the Oompa band was quiet and the people were looking. And so I thought, round number two, I'll start again. And I went back onto the stage. And in the back there, a lady went, <laughs> fell off a chair and went, <laughs> and there she lay. <laughs> so the medical doctors came running and they took care of her or whatever, carried her out there. You know, it didn't make it easy to start that campaign. There was something important going on there. And I held the campaign. Needless to say, I was banned from that country after that. And uh, that's how it was. But it's interesting, when I went to another town, the students hired buses, buses, to come and talk to me secretly about all the things that are being taught which are not in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. And they were literally in tears and said, how do we handle this? We have to do these things. So, I'm sure something good came out of all of that drama, right? You cannot do anything against the truth. You can only do something for the truth. So the church has turned back from following Christ her leader and is steadily retreating towards Egypt. We spoke about courses that are compulsory that are definitely not from the Bible and spirit of prophecy, but are definitely from Egypt and Babylon. It happens in our churches. And there are people that weep and cry because of all of these things. And they were scared. They were scared, some of these people. We're so scared of standing for what is right. The Lord designed that the message of warning and instruction given through the Spirit to His people should go everywhere. But the influence that grew out of the resistance of light and truth at Minneapolis tended to make of none effect the light given to his people through the testimonies. People slight the testimonies, you end up like that. He thought he was the only one left. Isn't that cute? Such a nice story. We reserve power as the Lord of Israel to reach those who have cast his warnings and reproofs behind them and accredited all with coming from no higher source than Sister White. 
What can you say in excuse to God in the judgment for your turning from the evidence he has given you of his work? But their fruit, by their fruit you shall know them. Whatever dealings God has had and manifested in me, and by me in the past, I would not produce or rehearse before you. It is the present evidence for which you are accountable. So they shipped her off to Australia. My wife and I were in that subcontinent. And we visited, well, one of her former residences. It's also very close to one of the largest colleges in our church. And we were walking through there and looking at everything. And I was taking pictures. After all, I give lectures, don't I? So I've got lectures on the spirit of prophecy. I put it in there. And then the man came and he looked and followed us around. You know, I, for a moment there, I thought he was watching me whether I was going to, you know, pocket something or something like that. And my wife took an interest in all those interesting things. And there are some dresses there of Ellen G. White, which shows she was not some fuddy-duddy after all. They were a little bit brighter than you would expect, you know what I mean? And so she looked at all of these things. And the man came and he said, what are you doing? And we said, well, we're looking. Why? We says, because we're interested. Where are you from? So we, we told him where we were from. He was the curator of that institute. And then he said, and you're interested in this sort of stuff? I said, yes, this is fascinating. Do you believe it? And I said, sure. And then he sat down and he cried. He cried like a baby, an old man. And then there's my witness, my wife. Cried like an old man like a baby and we said what's the matter he says it's so nice that someone still believes she's so marginalized they're so ashamed of her name they try to hide it in every possible way they can and that's that is the sad state of my church no matter where you go whether it is in North America whether it is in Europe whether it's there in the Pacific, no matter where you go. I've just come from Ethiopia. It's like going way back past the Middle Ages. Exactly the same spirit of disbelief. When is my church going to wake up? When are we going to understand that where there is no vision, the people perish? But he that keeps the law, happy is he. I'm instructed to say to our churches, study the testimonies. They are written for our admonition and encouragement upon whom the ends of the world are come. If God's people will not study these messages that are sent to them from time to time, they are guilty of rejecting light. And again, I want to reiterate, I'm not telling my stories to attack my church. I'm just telling my story to show the condition and to beg people to look at the parallels and see that we are repeating the history of Israel as verily as if we were they. And if we do not come back into harmony with his word and to believe every word so that even, even if a prophet would say something as stupid and ridiculous as if you want these walls of Jericho to fall, take a trumpet, walk around it seven times and blow it and it will fall. I mean, any logical person would say, you have lost it. Right? But they did it. And what happened? They fell. And the same we may experience. Because it is by faith that we will enter in and not by works. May God bless us as we contemplate these things. Amen.